Hello, and welcome to the lovely view of my bug rack. Uh, I have with me a baby collared lizard who doesn't want to go to bed. Um, and today I'm going to talk about blue fanning death beetles, because for those who are not aware, uh, they are breedable, and I am currently breeding some. So I was going to show you uh, what I'm working on, and... I've got a few that I'm going to be moving into the incubator today, so I was going to show you that, so. So I've got my beetles in a modest fishbowl. Show a baby collared lizard for perspective and size. Uh, this one here, that one is Dulcinea, that's a female. Let's see, that one back there, that's Ronaldo, that's a male. That one back in there, which one are you? Can't quite get a good look at that one. Um, but right now I have... What was that? I don't know what that was. I have <laughs> two males and two females in here right now. Um, I Oh, and two of their offspring, actually. I still have two of those. Um, which are both female right now. Uh, but yes, I've got two breeder females, two breeder males. And they are in Terra Sahara substrate. They've got like a little food dish. They've got all sorts of things to climb on and explore. They're just starting to come out for the night. They love to come out in the evening. Moving on to, oh, I offer them um, some light basking heat. This is just a small halogen basking spot. Um, I keep the larva in this little like tool organizer. It's to organize like screws and nuts and bolts and stuff. Um, but the two that I have ready to incubate are actually in these little vials. And I'm going to put this cute little baby back so that I can grab those vials and show you. Okay. So there, we've got a good view of one of them. A little hard to see, but I'm waiting until they're at least an inch, ideally two inches long before I put them in incubation. Um, I'm feeding them a grand variety of foods. They love their proteins, so I use a dog food, dead insects. I use like a hermit crab food mixed in with um, dried flowers, bee pollen. Um, I've got some seeds of various plants. Right now I've got a bunch of amaranth mixed in there. A bunch of stuff anyway. Um, and I sprinkle a little bit in there and they munch that up. Once they're ready for incubation, once they're big enough, I have this laboratory incubator that I'm trying to get exactly to 88 degrees. So that one says 87, that one says 86. So we're gonna turn it up a little bit. Turn it up just a little bit. This says 82, it lies. I'm going off of these guys here. Um, once that reaches 88, and once these guys are a good size, I'm going to put them in the incubator. Once they pupate into a little pupa, uh, my ones took about two weeks or so to then hatch out as proper beetles. When they first hatch out, they will be uh, pale uh, and eventually darken to like a chocolatey brown, kind of like a rusty reddish brownish color. Um, and very slowly they'll darken to like a black. And then after reaching that black stage, they will start to develop that protective waxy coating that gives them their namesake blue. After hatching out, I want to give them some time before I put them under heat. I give them a few weeks before I put them in with the rest of them. Um, I keep them in separate little containers. I feed them some really healthy foods like bee pollen, seeds, stuff like that, um, to offer them moisture. Um, I'm not leaving a water dish in here because I don't want to risk them drowning. Instead, I offer things like fresh carrot. You know, and once they dry up like that, I take it out and I replace it with something new like acorn squash. And as soon as that one dries out, I replace it and so on and so forth. And that's how I raise up the little guys until they're ready to join the rest of them. It says 88. 
so take just these two. This one's still too tiny. It's not ready yet, but these two. Important note, when you are putting them in for incubation, don't stop offering food. Um, you, you can incubate them, but they may not be ready to actually pupate yet. So you need to make sure that they still have access to food while they're going through that process, while they're bulking up to get ready. Um, and once you add heat to this slightly moist substrate, you're gonna notice mold growth is gonna start happening. So be on top of that. Don't let it get out of hand, clean out any stuff they haven't eaten and refresh it regularly. So we can see this guy's got some little tunnels going on. Good baby, there he is. So it's looking pretty big. This one I know is pretty big, but is currently hiding. But we're gonna put those in incubation and hope for the best, fingers crossed. Come back, Ronaldo. Um, moisture for the larva and for incubation. I forgot to touch on that. So um, I do spritz down the containers for incubation. So when I put them in their little vials to incubate, I spritz down just a little section of it. I don't want everything to be super wet but I also want to make sure that the substrate is a good consistency where they can create a little pocket to pupate in. Because um, if that substrate doesn't hold its shape, it'll just collapse on them and they're not going to be able to pupate properly. And when they eventually turn into a beetle, they're not going to be able to hatch out properly. So making sure the moisture is just right in there will help them out. The reason I keep the breeders in a fairly small container with loose substrate is mostly for egg collection. Um, if I kept them in something too large, that's going to be way too much material to sift through. Um, I use a little bit of window screen to sift through the substrate to find the eggs. The eggs are like half the size of a grain of rice. They are very, very small. They're pale, um, kind of like a whitish creamish color. Um, and they're sometimes sticky enough that the substrate will stick to them, so it'll just look like a little a little clump of a substrate with a little bit of white on the inside. That's an egg. When I find eggs, I put them in one of these little drawers, and I wet half the substrate, and then I leave the other half dry. I don't wet the egg directly. Now, one thing I have noted that I don't know if anyone else has reported on, um, I've noticed the eggs will hatch out regardless of the substrate moisture content. They'll still hatch even if it's bone dry. But the larvae seem to die out a lot quicker if they don't have access to some moisture. They die out really quick if they are kept bone dry. And I've heard some people report that they keep theirs bone dry no problem. I just haven't found that to be the case. So if anyone else is also breeding these guys, I'd love to hear your take on it, what you do. Um, I do offer these guys where this live plant is. I water that regularly. So there is a moisture pocket here. So in case there's any eggs that I miss, the larva should be able to retreat around this plant and I should be able to find them there. So I'm hoping to find fewer dead babies in here because I did recently switch out the substrate and add a new plant to try to get better results there. This one, oh, this one is Don Quixote. This one's a male. The males are a little bit smaller than the females. Hope I can get it to focus. I'm doing this on my phone, so bear with. E. Uh, the males are a little bit smaller than the females in my experience, but that's not always a foolproof way of telling if it's male or female. The main way that you can tell if you have a male or female beetle is by looking at the underside of their antenna. Now, I'm not gonna be able to show you this on camera because my phone camera is not that good, but if you do a deep dive on Google, I'm sure you can find some photo references of beetle antenna for blue fanning death beetle. Uh, the males will have these little tiny clear hairs on the underside of their antenna and the females are not gonna, oh, this hat. The females are not gonna have 
noticeable hairs on the underside of their antenna. So that's a nice easy way to tell the main difference. Um, in my experience, I don't know if this is everyone's, but in my experience, the males play dead a lot more than the females. And I don't know why, but they do. But that's blue fainting duck beetles. They're a very cool pet. They're very endearing. They're very charming. They just kind of trundle about. No thoughts. You know, they're just little, little innocent bugs and I enjoy them immensely. Um, and they're very easy to keep. So if you're looking for a pet invertebrate that can live more than a year, um, I've got some that I've had for going on two years now and those were wild caught. Um, so we really only have just begun to breed them in captivity, so we don't really know the full extent of their lifespan in captivity. Um, but I'm expecting several years out of my guys, so it's very exciting. And I would highly recommend. They're great little guys. Ain't ya? Well, thank you for watching. I think I'm going to wrap this one up. It's not a very long video, but there's also not a whole lot of information to cover. I feel like I've kind of already covered every, everything. If you have any questions though, let me know. And, oh, I need to sign off for this week. Oh shoot. Um, thank you for watching and don't drop your beetles in a bucket.